Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Talking RV Tech, and this is our third episode, um, and we're just going to go live with questions. Uh, I've got Dustin and Zach from Washington, and uh, Ashley is behind the scenes. Chuck Woodbury is lurking back on the other side, the editor uh, of it. So hi, Chuck, and welcome, everybody. I would like to start off and give you one of my favorite uh, little anecdotes or something uh, that we hear a lot when we're at shows and places. Uh, about the whistling gopher, which is a, a, an issue with um, in the RV industry. And a whistling gopher is one of these uh, elderly gentlemen that's looking to buy an RV and he walks around and he looks at the whole thing and he looks at the salesman and the salesman said, can I help you? And he says, yeah, well, what's that? What's that big thing there, gopher? And the salesman says, well, that's a $250,000. And the guy goes, Whee! so that's a whistling gopher. And uh, that's one of my favorite ones from Mike. Vitito, who I spent years with at Winnebago, and I think it was ironic. He was kind of the preppy boy with button-down shirts and penny loafers, and I was the small-town boy. And uh, the first question he asked me when we were going to go on the road and train dealers was, well, when do you have time to do your banking? And I think I was about 24 mm -hmm. years old at the time, and I said, pretty much whenever I pull in the ATM to see how much is in my checking account. And uh, his his funny thing was, he asked, where are we going to stay with these motorhomes? And I said, well, we can stay in KOAs. And he went, how do you spell that? And I'm like, oh, well, this is going to be a long trip. So with that, we'll bring Dustin back in. Um, I'm, where am I at here? There's Dustin and Zach. And welcome, guys. Um, I don't think we have any questions coming up now, but we did get a couple beforehand. So what I'm going to do is key up the first question here and bring it on board so this gentleman, he did not tell me what kind of an RV he has, but he wants to live stationary about 90% of the time. So I'm assuming when he says live stationary, meaning he's going to be in the unit, not stored. So that means the slide room will probably be out. And that's his question is, should we put slides in and out once in a while or do other things so that it works when we travel? Dustin, I'll defer that to you. All right. So... Oops, there it is. So basically, uh, we'll give you two different scenarios. So if you're staying in a travel trailer or a fifth wheel and you have your site outs out permanently full time, the uh, best advice from all the manufacturers is to operate the rooms at least once a month in and out. Um, some things to consider depending upon the temperature, weather, wind, you know, your site out seals are now exposed permanently to the elements. So a lot of the site out treatments, and I'll show you a couple of them real quick. One of them is a protect all product. It's called a site out rubber seal treatment. And that comes out like a spray foam mousse. Another one that we use is a product that's made by Starbright that just says rubber uh, seal conditioner and it's more of a spray trigger. So you can get into areas inside as well. Um, both those products are, you know, when you're treating the side outs, I want you to think of that as like a windshield wiper blade that can go bad, except for it's a lot more expensive to replace it and to purchase it. So That's a sample of one right there. Yeah, exactly. And so some of that stuff's pretty expensive and some of it's not sold in a normal small amount of footage. So like say Dave, for example, if a customer came in and only needed 10 feet, they can't buy 10 feet. They're going to have to be subject to buy a 50 foot roll or 350 foot, foot roll. roll. Yeah, yeah. They, it depends on the seal Same. that they sell it in. in mass quantities not just little sections of by the foot for the most part yeah and so going back to the conditioners the conditioners are anti-static um there are a uv blocker in them there's a water repellent in them um, and that's going to keep the seal soft and pliable so that they're actually doing their job by gliding in and out a dry or unconditioned seal can actually cause drag on the room and cause some premature wear on the mechanisms or systems that's in them. If so, if it's a cable-driven system or Schwintech, you know. So each each site out manufacturer is different. So yeah. well, and in worst case too, the the seal won't seal. Exactly. Then and, and you'll get moisture inside. Yeah. Moisture so, wind. Yeah. Now I have now, heard uh, some of the comments that we've gotten in the past when we talk about seal conditioning. Is some people uh, say they use baby powder. What do you think of that? not a big fan of that um that's pretty much going to dry the seal and pull the oils that are in the rubber out yeah and another scenario is like say you have a class a motorhome or class c 
those units may have a hydraulic slide out system as well as leveling jacks. And it's the same thing with those operate the rooms at least once a month and the leveling jack systems. And we also see it on a lot of newer fifth wheels nowadays. They have hydraulic, uh, you know, like a lipper uh, system in it. You want to operate those cylinders at least once a month. Yeah. Um, one thing I want to jump on there, you mentioned the baby powder. Um, the most common time that I actually see people bring that up and, and maybe it's just in me doing this or not really the customer specifying um, the BAL Accu slides, the cable driven slides, because they run on that wear bar on the bottom. If you're actually using um, a liquid, you know, product to do anything on the bottom there, it causes there to be friction on there and then it starts to chatter. Yeah, so people yeah. go, okay, well then I need to use something dry like baby powder. Um, and just kind of a reference onto that. A lot of the older style Accu slides, uh, they want you to put rollers underneath them now. If you get in contact with them, there's a build sheet for adding rollers and stuff, and that'll take care of that issue. Well, in both the AccuSlide, the cable slides, and the Schwinn pit, you know, the mm -hmm. whole idea of those is the rollers take the weight of that room. The, the gear should have no weight on it. It should just be pushing, pulling it backwards. And one of the things that, that I've seen uh, with the baby powder is, you know, if you get any moisture and it rains or, you know, it's humid or something like that, that turns to paste. You know, yeah, pretty yeah. much in that stuff, and then and then it's worse for it almost. And yeah, yeah. Uh, the other thing too is that I've seen where we've we've got a lot of construction workers out here in the Midwest that come in for the wind farms and different things, and and they bring their rigs and stay a long time with all the rooms extended, and we have tons of wind out here, and it just seems like a dust bowl constantly going. And with those slide rooms out and those mechanisms and rams and gears all exposed to that harsh wind and all the debris and stuff like that, you know, that, that you really need to get in there and, and, you know, clean those up. And every man, every manufacturer has a recommendation, you know, some of them, uh, HWH recommends using WD-40, which none of the other ones do, but they do recommend cleaning it off really well afterwards. And talk a little bit about, you know, conditioning that, mechanism itself what what should a person do if they're like him you know 90 percent of the time it's going to be out and could have problems so if it's a lippert system you don't want to spray any lubricant in the actual rails itself yeah there's a video that lipper provides that goes in and shows you actually how to lube the gibbs and the shoe and the and different parts on it the v rollers and stuff on the swintech system yep and that's that's a T, uh, ptfe spray and one can will last you almost a lifetime of the coach. I mean, it's, right. little, yeah, it's, it's you know, little quick yeah. sprays and you're done. CRC um, is their recommendation. CRC, yeah. yep. CR, CRC with uh, PTFE. Yep. Definitely. And they have, I, I just want to throw this in. Lippert has a phenomenal education department, their learning center. Uh, they have a certification for technicians that I have gone through, but they also have one for owners. And, uh, you know, I think if you own, any kind of slide room mechanism, and it's a Lippert product, which almost all of them are now. They bought Quickie, they bought Power Gear, they have Schwintech, and their own system. Go in and just take their owner, their owner orientation coach, and become familiar with what you need to understand with those things. Because, you know, I would say with with the Schwintech thing, seventy five percent or more of the issues that have happened with that thing are owners not understanding, and either, yeah. either overloading or not leveling or power or you know, I mean, it's just it's on and on and on and and uh you know not saying they're the best system in the world but they they, they get, you're not getting a fair rap yeah. Yeah. yeah even the old the older style ram systems you know the under rail frame systems there's different other companies now that make supports for those so that if the coach is moving or rocking that you can go in and brace them to help carry to support the load because some of those rooms aren't designed to be out full time that's, you know that brings up a good point I, I i know chuck used to go to louisville every year in december there was the big manufacturer show in louisville kentucky and when the first slide rooms came out i remember those units had 55 gallon drums underneath the slide room and then black <laughs> curtains ar around the, so you couldn't see the drums holding the, the rooms up so times have changed so a little yeah. bit here when it, comes um, to the, when it comes to the Lippert products, you know, like you're saying, go on their stuff. They offer a lot of supply. 
or support for them. Um, for everybody that's pretty comfortable with using smartphones and stuff, the Lippert Now app is a great app to have. It has all that information at your fingertips. And it's a lot better now, but back in the day, as you know, you used to call Lippert for tech support and you'd sit on the phone for 45 minutes yeah. before somebody answers. And yeah. so now you can chat to text. And, and as a little uh, tip to the people out there, if you keep going, I don't understand, I don't understand, I don't understand, you can get right through on the phone. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I've had great, I've had great success getting in with them and, and talking to them. Um, you know, tech support. Um, Barbara has a question here, and I know she came in on rack opinion slides. I've seen posts that were comparable size slides. Different manufacturers use different sizes. How often do you elude those? And one of the things. So what rack opinion is is it's a gear system that moves and it pushes a rail that have teeth in the rail. So that's that's what they call a rack and pinion. That, uh, Power Gear, I think, was one of the, well, Newmar was the first. They had their own proprietary system. And then Power Gear came out with one for, for many years, and Lippert bought theirs, and so there's other ones out there. But, yep, yep. So what's the recommendation on, on the rack and pinion? So it really depends on how much they're using the coach. Um, you know, there's on all four sides of that tube, you want to go ahead and loop that, not just where the gears are at. And then underneath there, you want to check, you know, there is two gear packs on each side. So you want to check, you know, to make sure nothing's coming loose on them. You want to lubricate those. On the drive shaft that's there too, there's quarter inch bolts on each side. It's occasional, the wall router snap off or break. So you want to check those every so often, keep some backups, you know, quarter inch 20s. Yep. And, uh, just same thing. Just use your own, use your own best judgment. Yep. I mean, usually once a year is a good call. Year, I mean, your yeah. average person is taking how many trips a year? You know, if you're doing it yep. before you're storing it, you're doing it before you're doing your, your trip or whatever it may be. Once a year is a good call. Um, and like you said, some of the two on twos or two on threes or whatever style system they are. Um, some of them even have uh, almost like these nylon skids that are inside the tube that the tube runs in and out of Glide. checking and, and verifying that those aren't broken or cracked. And, uh, yeah. but once a year is probably a good call. And then yeah. if you use it more, do it more. Yeah. Something I learned a long time ago, and it doesn't really matter the slide. I mean, obviously the, the, uh, swim tech side's different, but the rule of thumb was always run the rim out about 95% and then just tap the button to bump it and let it rest out. You know, don't sit there and hold it till it just uh, let it clutch and yeah. clutch and make on, it The only exception to that is Schwintech. Schwintech, yes. Schwintech has two motors up in the top of in the wall, and they want you to take it all the way out and let the motor stop. So you keep the button in till the motor stops because the, if you have a heavy side on one side with a refrigerator or whatever, and you know nothing on the other end, those motors work differently or, and you know one's harder than the other one so they get out of sync and that is a huge issue with the Schwintech is they want you to run it keep the button on till it you know and and that doesn't happen because like you said people stop it and want to you know just snug it up there so okay. it is important with the Schwintech uh, to do that I've talked to them several different times also with the power gear um, I spent a lot of time with them they do recommend three in one oil on the bearings so you were talking about the gear and and you know the, the saddle bearings on the sides of those you can see them when you get underneath it you got the rail that comes along and then the gears here they don't recommend putting anything on the gear yeah but on that saddle yeah. bearing yeah and lippert has just recently started um recommending when i've talked to them that if it's really rusty and you're getting a lot of clanging and noise and squeaking stuff like that they recommend a, a good uh, dry silicone, and uh, I think there's even a white lithium, and wipe it off really good. And, you know, so that's the first time I've ever heard anybody talk about putting something on the rail itself. But, you know, I, I would, I would yeah. caution to do that. And what I really tell people is you got an owner's manual for yeah. that. It, it'll tell you what it is. Yeah. You know, there's so many different slides. And you know, the thing that I think is ironic is you can get a different opinion from just about anybody. Yeah. And the you reason know? I say on all four sides, Dave, is on the tubular rails, there's little Teflon tabs that are about the size of a dime. Yeah. So you'll see like a drag mark on all three sides. That's yeah. a guide to help keep that tube going in and out. If, over time, if, if they don't ever get lubed, and I'm not saying a lubricant that's going to be harsh to damage those Teflon. 
if those Teflon tabs that are just a pressed in piece, if they pop loose or come loose, now that tube has got chatter and it will end up gouging and, and jam itself and can cause damage. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, it's just things that you've learned, you know, along the way when we've replaced things. Yep. Just like the Swintec slide outs, you know, recently I just spoke to a rep at, at LCI as well. And, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion online about their systems versus the new Vroom system. It's kind of, you know, I, what I explained to him is I said, hey, on the motorhome side, we don't see that many systems fail versus the travel trailer or fifth wheel. And I still brought it back to a whole suspension issue, you mm-hmm. know, the jarring and shaking of that slide. Yep. And, uh, because movement. And, movement. Yeah. yeah. If, if you got any resistance in that box going in and out, then those motors can't handle it. Yeah. They just, and you get, you get so much more twisting in the, the lighter weight trailers, um, yeah. you know, that, that are, when you go down the road and you move it and stuff like that, Greg has a good point and it's here too. I understand slide rooms should not be supported by the supports. And that depends on the mechanism. You know, if you got like HWH, the whole room is on those, those slide outs come those, uh, that the bars yeah. and rams, we call them. Some of the rack and pinion just are, are the same way. Now the, the smaller ones that have just the push rod. No, you know, that, that is the roller that's supposed to, take all the weight in it so it it you know there's not a um, a complete answer and and what i was referring to earlier is you can get so many different opinions you know every slide mechanism company that i've talked to and and it's been a lot says level the coach and secure it before you run the slides up now integra tells right in their owner's manual run the slide rooms out first, then level and stabilize the coach because they want it in a camping, relaxed, whatever it happens. And, I, and I've talked to them before. They use a power gear system and I've talked to the power gear engineers and he said, we have gone round and round and round with them. And, you know, at, at some point in time, I've, I've gone head to head with the Winnebago engineers, you know, in the past. And I wasn't always right, but, you know, it, it's everybody gets their opinion and I'm still a firm believer in leveling and stabilizing just yeah. to let's, keep that. Like, let's talk about like the uh, ground con, ground control system versus like a HWH system. Well, Major Tom. What's that? Major <laughs> Tom. I'm sorry. I had to throw that in. That's an old, that's an old David Bowie <laughs> joke. And Mike Sokol would have gotten that. Yeah. Ground control to Major Tom. Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. I get it. <laughs> But uh, the ground control Olympic system versus the uh, space oddity, <laughs> space oddity. <laughs> versus uh, the uh, ground control. Now you made me lose train of thought. <laughs> Both of you guys I'm getting old. That's Can't a great song, though. <laughs> <laughs> but the two systems, you know, HWH tells you every five years you need to replace all the fluid, but the LCI doesn't. No, and the systems operate the exact same. So. You know, yeah, you can get a wide variety of, of different things in there. So let's go back to Barbara had an earlier one. I'm going to throw this up there. Uh, nope, that was not it. Sorry, Barbara. Claude had one. I have seen bumps on the edge of the fiberglass roofs where they bend around to meet the walls. What causes that? So, is it talking about the so it, it, He's talking what I think, or he's talking what I think he's talking about fiberglass roofs, the rollover, right? You're starting to get the ripples. Um, it's not that there's uh, like an exact thing that's causing some of that. Um, there we go. Yeah, there you go. That's a, yeah. <laughs> um, well, and, and here's something too. Yeah, we see that all the time. Yeah. It's not, it's not fastened. It's not, most of them don't have an adhesive on that corner. It's just resting in that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Forest River, back in the day, um, I don't remember exactly what years, 2014 and on, somewhere in there, um, they actually had, I don't want, it wasn't a recall, but they had an issue with this same exact situation. And so like on their Georgetowns and stuff like that, they offered a replacement or a kit that basically just, yeah, sheeted over each other to take care of that issue because they were starting to do it so bad, they were blistering and splitting at the top. They were cracking. Well, and... um... I think Chemlite Phylon, who makes that fiberglass, had what we called a cottage cheese issue, 
that was, you know, inherent to the sidewall and those spots. And then, you know, it all related to the exposure to UV and moisture and, and uh, just decomposing. So, um, you know, I, I guess I would look at if you got, so what he's talking about from the roof, it goes over the sidewall, like we just saw, um, you know, one of the things that I would do is it bumps or, you know, at one point there, there was uh, manufacturers were using pebble grain which was just a whole series of bumps because that pebble grain versus the smooth is so much stronger in that bend. And there's, you know, some of the manufacturers decided to do a, a three inch bend, which meant it, it bent in three inch distance. And some of them went four. So it wasn't quite as drastic in there. So I, I would have somebody take a look at that fiberglass just to make sure it's, it's not going to go further. Years ago, we used to see that more often and we would take and relief cut it we would fill it up with fiberglass and resin, sand it down to kind of get back the shape of it. And then depending on if it was a colored side radius or just a white radius, we would use like a roof coating to cover it. Or we would go down and get like a, like almost like a rhino liner, but they make it where you can get it in a, a paint roller. And we would paint the sides, get a color, color match to paint the sides. Like if it was a burgundy or tan or whatever color it was. Yep. There's lots of lines to fix it. Some of the old timers would say, "Put a great big strip of Eternabond." Yeah, across. <laughs> like duct tape. All right. Next question comes from Hughes. It says, uh, "Do you recommend an RV cover when in storage for the winter? Winter. If so, what brand would you buy?" So this is one of those ones that I feel that if you ask everybody, everybody's got a different answer. Um, here's the deal with covers. So a lot of times they are very specific on size. It's 26 and one inch to 29 and one inch. Like they're very particular. And a lot of times you don't end up, you're right in the middle. You're never like right on there where the thing's super tight. So if you're sitting there, depending on where it's stored, if you got a lot of wind and stuff, that cover is going to be moving and shaking and wearing on the edges of the roof and all the products on the roof. Um, but is that worse off than just sitting out in the sun? Well, it depends on the maintenance that you're doing, you know, if, are you doing your preventive roof, you know, roof treatments and taking care of the sealants and stuff. It's really dependent on you. Um, as for brand, uh, ADCO is super popular. Classic Industries is super popular. There used to be business partners. Too. Oh, did they? Yeah. yeah. Well, they, Ad, ADCO and, uh, you know about that? ADCO and Classic used to be business uh, partners? No, I, I, I've known ADCO and, you know, we've recommended them. For years, sold them at Winnebago. I, I like the fact that they customize yeah. so you get a better fit. They, they both customize, and Classic also offers a lifetime warranty on, on some of them, on their high-end yeah. ones. But like he was saying, everybody has a different preference. I'm against the cover. One, I worry about the consumer falling off the roof, stepping through something, tripping, stepping over a plumbing bench, sitting up there trying to wrestle that thing on and getting hurt. I've seen it happen over time and time. The typical cover, you know, they make, we're all looking to save money when we go out to buy something that expensive, right? So they usually will make different types of covers for different territories, you know, you know, sun and shade versus, you know, rain, rain snow, and snow, covers like Atco House, you know, like four season covers or two season covers. And like Zach said, maintenance is the key. You know, if you if you're keeping up on the roof with like say 303 on the different plastics, vinyls, and rubbers on the coach, using some type of wax, uh, you know, whether it be protect all is what we like to use, or now that we're talking about the ceramic coatings, as long as you're putting something on the coach to help protect it, that's going to be a benefit of it. If you're going to put the cover on there, it's still going to grow mold underneath between the layer of the cover and the roof, depending on the condensation. So those covers are breathable. So you still have temperature differences between the two. A lot of times when, when uh, if it's an owner, like he said, he has it in a, a storage yard in this is a car that went by, sorry. In, <laughs> in the storage yard. I was hoping it wasn't Zach's stomach. <laughs> <laughs> basically. Great thumbnail. <laughs> basically in the storage yard situation, I don't like it because now you have a unit that's covered. If somebody wants to break into the coach, they can get in and do whatever they want, and nobody will ever see them while they're in there. So it's just, you know, again, preferences. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, so I'm interested. What's your opinion? What do you think? Well, I'm, I'm a cover fan, um, mostly because being in the Midwest, we have such harsh 
uh, snows and, you know, the stuff just sits up in there and we get a cover and we generally put some kind of, uh, you know, rubber swim noodles in the center, we build a triangle so that we get good snow off of it and when it melts. Um, and, you know, when it comes to resale value on an RV, the look of the RV holds almost twice as much resale value. You know, you could have something that's absolutely perfect. And if it's faded and all the decals are cracked, you're going to get half of what it's worth, yeah. no, no matter what it's like. And, you know, I just have seen these that have sit, they sit outside and all the sealants dry up in here. And, and we have such bad weather changes, you know, I mean, we have mornings where it's, it's 20 degrees in the morning and it'll get 60, 70, 80 degrees in the afternoon. And, you know, all that stuff, it, expands and contracts so much and then it, it it just gets pounded by the sun and so you know we we pretty much are you know most people here but you're right if it if it starts to bang around and it's it's going to rub spots somewhere it's going to break covers um we got a local guy here it's kind of funny he's got a trailer and it's got two um rooftop mm -hmm. air conditioners on it he puts cover every year and so one spring he came over and asked us if we uh we did any work on air conditioners, you know, he's right across the street. And uh, what happened? And he said, I've got, it's snowing inside my rig through my air conditioners. And so what happened is a squirrel got up under the cover, yeah. went up, crawled up, got into the air conditioner styrofoam, the, the you know, the basic uh, insulation around the, the fan and just chewed it all to pieces. And when he started it up, whoosh, yeah. just, flew inside there so you know he this this last year he didn't have a cover on he said i want to see that squirrel like yeah but, see, yeah, it's, still gonna get up. it's yeah, just it's, it's all uh, it's all sunshine and margaritas here in california so we don't have to worry about it exactly. <laughs> <I'm in ocean laughs> well, it's, out here it's Oktoberfest, you know oh. <laughs> fuck christ uh so we got what type of well we had one more question i think that somebody had asked about to get off of slide rooms, uh, she's got an Integra. Is that there? It is 2012 Integra. Um, Ar Arlen or Arlene? I'm not sure uh, what that is, but uh, anyway, what's the maintenance on an Integra slide? And they do use Power Gear. I think they still. Well, 2012 they would have. Yeah. So Jacob, uh, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it's the big Class C. Uh, I'm assuming that's what that Aspire is, and it's got the rack and pinion. So, you know, Arlene, pretty much what we said beforehand, inspection is the best thing. Yeah. Condition those seals and then, you know, get underneath and look at that mechanism. If it's really rusty, if it's if it seems to be jerking and, and find out what's underneath, too. You know, a lot of times those rollers will break on the sides. So you'll, you've got little yeah, tabs in there and they ended up breaking and almost rollers almost going sideways. You know, so it's just crooked a little bit, and so uh, those are the things that that I would I would highly recommend. Yeah, um, once a year, take it to a professional, yep. someone that's used to looking at it. Have them yep. just double check everything. Yep, you know? I agree. Um, so Bruce claimed he can't hear us, and so hopefully Bruce, you can hear us. If anybody, I, I think everybody else can. So let's go to uh, Barbara then, um, and she asked. Um, Oh, it's it's on right. Alpine Arcadia fifth wheel. If they use pure sign or modified sign inverters, no answer back yet. Researching from what I've uh, modified may not be good for computers, electronics, residentials. So, um, Zach, I know you work a lot with that. Um, they're not going to stick a modified sine wave inverter in there. The coach, if, when they're going through and setting up, a lot of times the factories put factory inverters in there. Um, they're usually set up for TVs, things like that. Um, so they're not going to stick a modified sine wave inverter in there because that's on the circuit. And that's 100 percent correct. Your modified sine wave inverters are what you use for like um, like a drill. You're using an electric drill or something similar that doesn't have a control board in it. Um, and they're, they're not going to do that to you. It's 99.9 it's percent .9 sure it's going to be uh, a pure sine wave inverter. As so how do you tell? How, how um, do you tell? I have one here. Let me just see what it says. Yeah, usually it'll it'll tell you on the unit. Um, if you're using the unit, you're getting a lot of high buzzing and whatnot from those electronics. Usually you can tell, but it'll tell you specifically on the unit. Or if it shows you the wave, you see 
the wave in the picture is completely um, right there. Yeah, yeah, it's showing like a loop like this. A modified is going to be a square. It's going to show like that same kind of picture that they're going to be cut off. Yeah. And if, if you, you should be able to find your inverter, it's normally it's in a compartment outside up underneath, uh, you know, either mounted up to the top and she had the uh, Integra. So that I'm pretty sure that would be either in the battery compartment um, or a lot of times they don't put them in there because they're open, you know, they have to vent, but you should be able to see that, like you just said, or if you get the model number, you should be able to, you know, rather than going to Keystone who has, 15 different lines yeah. and 47 models in each one of those lines. And you're, you know, and, and the documentation isn't like the automobile industry. So, you know, I, I would say get the, get the model number of that uh, inverter and you should be able to go to progressive dynamics or go power or freedom. Um, Antrex. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Barbara then is, is dominating the questions here today. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, because she's about the only one asking. So we'll do that. Oh, Claude has another one coming up. We'll get there. Uh, if solar, I think, covers defeat the purpose. Good point. Yep. Good point. Yeah. Most of the people that in, in my area, what they do is, um, you know, we're seeing less people put solar panels up on the roof, you know, simply because that you, when you're camping and you're dry camping, when you need the solar, you're not plugged in, you have to be out in the sun to get charging power. And that means you're going to raise the interior of that coach by 20, 30 degrees, and you don't have an air conditioner, but you can't put it in the shade because then you don't get solar power. So you start using these portables or a combination of those, then you can take that portable. And, and when you're in storage, you know, I mean, we're different out here because we, um, we've got about 11 months of winter. And, uh, you know, we, we were lucky this year. Summer came on a weekend, so we were real, we were happy about that. But, um, you know, you guys probably don't have quite the storage um, time-wise. But, um, you know, when you put your unit in storage and you shut everything off, you're still going to get some battery drain out of your house batteries, probably from the LP leak detector. That's that's going to give a little bit unless you by, bypass it. But just naturally, you're going to lose a little, but you don't need – 200 watts of storage for wintertime. And what, what would you recommend, Zach? Um, you're talking about for like the solar itself, just like I mean, what you bring in. Yeah. What, how, how much solar power charging power do you need if you're just storing it off? You're so it depends on how your disconnect and stuff is wired. You said turning it off, you're still going to pull. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're a lot of times the manufacturer set it up on a safety thing. Things like the LP detector, carbon monoxide, if it's a hardwired, is going to constantly pull. Memory for the radio is going to pull. Yeah, stuff like yep. that. It's it's not very much. Um, yeah, your your normal single panel kits pull in like nine amps. Some of the cheaper ones pull in less. That's more than sufficient to keep that thing up. Um, yeah. Battery. If you watch some of the other ones that we did back, we talked about like average battery loss um, when they just sit stationary. Um, usually a single panel is going to take care of that, whether it's, you know, a, a normal sized portable yeah. unit, which I mean, if you're storing it, that's probably we not what, what you want to do. But 4% yeah. per week is what we, is what the average. Yeah. Was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I know for, you know, many, many years, um, RV manufacturers had a real problem with the units that sat on dealers lots. And, you know, because most of those aren't plugged in, you're seeing more dealers doing that now putting, you know, making it look almost like a campground. But for the most part, when they're sitting out on a lot, they're not plugged in, so the batteries are going to drain down. And it used to be that the LP leak detector would start beeping mm -hmm. when it, the battery got down below 10.5 volts. And so you're walking through the lot, and all you hear is beep, 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 beep. Yeah. You know, and you think right. it's a construction zone. And and uh, so uh, Winnebago, I think, was one of the first, and I, I know others have followed suit, where they put like a 30-watt panel up on the roof, and it's only dedicated for maintenance. When it when it's sitting either at the manufacturer or at the dealership, and you know, so you don't have to have a lot mm -hmm. just to maintain that battery with because it's not it's not drawing that much. So okay, all right. Uh, what type of caulking do you recommend for windows and doors? So out here, um, there's a lot more restrictions on different products because of California. 
So uh, just we'll say like the ProFlex, right? We can't get a lot of colors in the ProFlex out here. The only one that they allow is clear because of the regulations, but we use a lot of Boss silicones. And there's a lot of, when people hear silicones, they say, oh no, my RV manufacturer says no silicones. Well, there's thousands of different types of silicones. So make sure that they're rated exactly for RV application. See, they don't do that one out here anymore. You can't, yeah. get, you can't get that out here anymore. Yeah, you it's can't white. Get, That's right. Yep. It's a, so it doesn't fall into our compliance. Um, yep. But we use a lot of Boss silicones. We use a lot of uh, Dicor capsulant. That's um, another reason not to live in California. You can't <laughs> use this. There's, there's a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, the, the key in anything is that silicone is just this blanket term. Everybody thinks every silicone is silicone and it's not. And it's not. Now, what, what you need to do is you need to look at what material you're putting the sealant on that you need to. Is it fiberglass? Is it rubber membrane? Is it aluminum? Is it painted? Um, you know, so it, this is a self-leveling RV sealant that, that uh, you know, we've used in several different videos. Got it from Winnebago. Um, you know, as far as, as windows, um, I'm still a big fan of butyl tape. Yeah. You know, depending on the window, if you, if you install that well, and, and you check that and, and, you know, you don't have to, I know some people go in and cap seal the whole thing with silicone up, up over the top of it. To me, all that does is create a mess because it's going to attract grit and it's going to look, you know, pretty bad within six, eight months. Yeah, it, de it depends on what kind of silicone, what brands and stuff you use to. And yep, there's there's different qualities. Different ones have different adhesion qualities. So the same thing with when you go to remove it, some sealants are almost like putting on like a liquid nail. I mean, yeah, ProFlex, GeoCell, Geo that Cell. stuff is, it gets so hard and turns yellow and crusty. Um, yep. Going through like a Boss silicone, if you are cap sealing or whatever. Um, they make so RV nice. great. It's specific to, it says RV mobile yep. home. Like it's for that. Yeah. Um, somebody put ProFlex on there. It gets hard. Yeah. Claude, that's hundred it, percent. It, it does hundred yeah. percent. It's, yep. it's it just colors and turns, you know, white to tan and clear to gray. So what, what about, uh, the tried and true er Eternabond? Oh, so again, it comes back to the same thing with the RV covers, right? It comes back to the same thing with RV covers. We all have our different preferences. I see customers all the time online watch these videos of, hey, let's turn up on the whole coach. Let's turn up on every scene. If that was the case, you know, it's like less than 1% of manufacturers that I've seen have a turn up on tape on any of the roof seams. It's typically only on a slide out rooftop. It's great to use as a patch or, or a tear, an emergency, but you don't want to get in the habit. When I when we see coaches that come in that they've put a turnip on, on the turnip on over time, that material that's on it, whether you want to call it plastic or PVC or whatever the material you want to refer to it as, that breaks down. And then now you just have this glue mess that take you an eternity to take off. And that stuff wrinkles. So as it as it's shrinking in both directions, it's buckling and it's making little toothpick sized journals in it. It allows water to get in and still travel and then eventually causes the rest of the tape to lift up. Yeah. Well, and I think if you're gonna put that on there, at least seam the perimeter of it with like dicor or alpha cylinder or something. Right. And and I think too often what happens that I've seen when people, you know, they have a water leak and they don't really know where it's at for sure and they try the silicone and it goops all over because they don't get the right stuff and they didn't go in and prep the roof to begin with right and then they just slap the eterna bond over the entire top of it well you still got you know if you didn't take the old sealant off that that's going to lift up and it's you're going to have just as much of a problem yeah. as you had before so uh, you know i i think it's it's a good product used correctly like you're you're, you're saying um you know doug says it's pretty awesome and it's awesome on slide out you know, let's talk about flex tape well <laughs> and flex tape or flex seal on any of your stuff <laughs> nothing sticks to it and it doesn't come off 
Yes, it does. And don't spray Flex Seal on anything styrofoam. Please, It'll please, eat yeah. styrofoam. Not windows. Nothing. No. No. Flex not Seal good. should Flex Seal should only be used to put a screen door on the bottom of a boat. Well, yes, exactly. Yeah. That's what it should be used for. And uh, and maybe your gutters, but um, you know <laughs> Could a guy spray some on a coacher in her a while back. And he said, I sprayed that white flex seal on there. When we got up there with him, it was baby poop brown. And it doesn't, it doesn't come off. Nothing sticks to it. And they say in the in the commercials, ah, perfect for RV riffs. And they show a dude putting it on there. <laughs> Please don't do that. Don't do that. Doug says he's got some from 2005. Well, and that's probably true because it never comes off, it seems like. But I, I would yeah, I would, I just go over the top. Yeah. <laughs> I would venture to say that when that was put onto your roof, that the roof was prepped properly and and you know if well, everything was clean on it i i am you know i'm a big fan of the dicor self-leveling lap seal yeah. at the top or, or the non sag along yeah. the side even the alpha sealants that lippert makes <laughs> the california compliant ones do not self-level so if, if you came in here as a consumer or wanted to purchase some, we would tell you, no, don't get it. Yeah, it comes out like toothpaste. It comes out like toothpaste. It comes out almost like non-sag, Dave, where you can't flow or, or self-level it out. It will not self-level. So, yeah. Um, well, I've, I've even noticed we did a we did a video and put a- Same thing uh, with Camco version, too. Camco has uh, a seal that it doesn't lay Wine guard. Out. Yeah, we put a wine guard uh, 360 plus air antenna on. And I put those self-leveling Dicor around the, the feet of it after we installed it. And uh, two days later, it still hadn't leveled completely yeah. out. And it was still a little tacky. And it's like, ooh, I wasn't real happy mm -hmm. with it. So we, we went back in and, and redid it with some of the uh, the 311 here. And, and nothing against the Dicor, but I think you got these formulations that have to be compliant. And they're not going to make something for California specific, you know, and then something for... Ohio and something, you know, that, that's one of the things that I found over the years is that when you've got states that have different regulations about certain things, they're going to make one for the most stringent and it's going to usually blanket the country. So, yeah. anyway, and that's what happened with the alpha cell. Yep. So, and what it is that's, that's missing in that, it's the solvents. So, the solvents failing to adhere to the TPO or rubber roof membrane, because I called them on it. I mean, we, we bought a bunch of cases. I had to return it. We had issues with it. We had roofs that we put it all on. It didn't self-level. Customers weren't happy. We'd take it off and redo it. And so it was, you know, it, it was very costly to me. And I also found out that, you know, they'll say in the owner's manuals, you can't put alpha, you know, dark dicor on an alpha roof or alpha sealant on a dicor roof. You can put whatever sealant you want on there. It's not going to avoid any of the 10-year, 12-year, 15-year warranties. They're not allowed by law to say that. And that comes from both reps. Yep. Yeah. Well, and this kind of adhere or, uh, adheres to that. That's good. We're, we're going to use um, refers to that. So he's got a fiberglass roof. Maintenance looks like there's been something rolled on. So I would imagine it's probably Dicor has their um, roll-on sealant, yeah. and then uh, there's there's now RV Armor is out there. Uh, do you guys? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff, so it's it's almost impossible to tell. And, and she, she, you know, if, if there is something that's been rolled on it, you you would want to wash it. Yeah, but we I don't use, think uh, real three protectant is going to do anything not to that, or that aftermarket no. product. So no. you, if if you have a coating up on the roof like that, and we we we're, we've tried all of them, and we do that as like a, a it's common. It's like once or twice a week here that we're applying those. We found the best luck with a GACO coating, but it's not the commercial grade, it's an RV grade. Uh -huh. And then we've switched recently to the Tundra because of the lifetime guarantees. Okay. And, and it I, sticks to like everything. Everything. Yeah. It doesn't, if you have an old coating, as long as it's not peeling oh. bad. Yep. Oh, yeah. Tundra's fantastic. Tundra. Yeah, yeah, we love Tundra. So, and then and what I would do, one of the things Alpha oh. Systems, you know, has their new roof material yeah. and i'm wondering if this isn't something i haven't tested it yet but who was the question? recommend murphy's soap to, to clean it yeah and yeah. and and to condition you know some of them would say clean first with like dawn dish soap and then condition with um they had their own you know proprietary conditioning uh procedure and some of the tpos most of them you want to die core um yeah. 
you know, but Alpha System switched to Murphy soap, and and I've used this. You know, you just put, and I don't even. I mean, it's not scientific. You you do that. You go, yeah, you know, bucket of water until it's not soapy anymore, and then it with a little more, and so. Uh, to answer their question, I would use either Dawn dish soap or Simple Green. And, and I, I like I like Dawn because it's really good on, uh, you know, like bird droppings and and roof tar stuff, and it doesn't seem to. Uh, it's just even their wash and wax soap too. Yeah, yeah, and it's environmentally friendly. I mean, after all, it saved the ducks up in Alaska, right? Okay. Uh, so Claude says I have a motorhome. Is there a problem filling the water tank and traveling to uh, to have water for an extended trip? Gas uh, well, there's there's two things that I would first of all you say get yeah, water weighs eight point six pounds per gallon, so whatever you're filling up in there, you got to factor that weight that you put on your motorhome, and you got to factor yourself in that motorhome and what's your cargo carrying capacity. So you know that that's something to take into consideration. The other thing is the longer you let it set inside that plastic, the the you know I, I the technical term is skunky. Um, you know, but that that's the only concern that I've had keeping it in there while it starts to taste like plastic. Um, I typically don't drink the water out of the tank myself. Smart and, man. you know, the only time I've really taken a lot of water with me is if I take uh, the granddaughters and um, we can fill up at home with soft water because they don't like taking showers with hard water. The hair gets all, you know. I don't really have that problem, Dustin. You don't have that problem. Does your hair get really stiff? Now, Zach's, yes. So those are the things. We, we As you get older, you don't have to worry about certain things like that. Just, uh, my, well, I didn't lose my hair. It's just it's now on, on my back for whatever. There you go. <laughs> While we're talking about water tanks, <laughs> you know, for those of you watching us live, um, Thetford makes a two-part cleaner. Camco makes a single stage cleaner. Uh, so there's a, a chemicals to flush out the water tanks, the lines. You know, I would recommend that you do that at least once a year. That's going to kill any bacteria. And, and uh, I think Dave's looking for one right now. <laughs> I, I mean, and unless you are worried about hard water and stuff like that, maybe we'll, yeah. get, on, we'll get on that next time or later or something. Um, for, the, for the most part, you can stop somewhere and fill the tank up before you get to where you're going, you know, yeah. where if you're worried about it. Um, well, and I think uh, every pilot and flying J now that has the yeah. RV lane, all, you know, has a dump station, has a fill station, has propane. Uh, so it's, you know, for a while there was getting a little, it was getting harder. You know, I, I remember I spent five years on the road traveling, training dealers and, you know, just about every rest stop had a dump station and a, and a potable water fill area. Um, unfortunately, you know, environmental issues and cost and people not cleaning up after themselves, you know, these got renovated and you don't see those much anymore. So for a while there, it was hard to find water yeah. uh, without going into a campground. And, you know, you don't always want to do that. So uh, it was it, it was a challenge, but I think you can find it a little more. But again, we get back to the fact that uh, you can carry it. Just be careful of the weight you're putting in. Yeah. So, so let's do. That was my warning that uh, there's 11 minutes left. <laughs> that wasn't my phone. That was a that was a warning. <laughs> there was 11 Answer uh, Greg's question. He says is is protect all all surface care adequate to protect TPO roof, you know, as well as the fiberglass uh, sides of the RV and the decals, and basically. Protectol is a great product. It's been around for years. It's been mentioned in all the motorhome magazines. That that you can go ahead and apply on almost any surface on the whole exterior of the coach. But Protectol does make a rubber roof cleaner and a rubber roof treatment. I have been putting myself for years the rubber roof treatment and use that cleaner on the TPO and have never had any issues. Just I don't put the UV treatment on as heavy as I would on a rubber roof. It can get it, slippery. It can get slippery. Yeah. So, you know, basically on a small towel and just go and wipe it on there. But both those products work great for cleaning. I think the Protect-All Cleaner 
for the roof works probably one of the best in the industry. I've tried them all. Yeah. Um, the protect all that they have is called their all purpose cleaner. Yeah. And it does have uh, carnauba yeah. uh, in, in it with UV protection. Yeah. And anti-static and suntan protectant, all kinds yeah, of stuff. Yeah. Yep. No, it's it, put it's, seven products in one. It's an outstanding product. Um, the other thing is he, okay, I've parked on gravel. Uh, we'll be sitting and we'll be sitting for approximately five months. Should I put something under my wheels like carpet or a board or wheels for the wheels to sit on? And, mm -hmm. you know, that I did an awful lot of research when I was working with the RV Safety and Education Foundation, developing their safety program and tires was the big one. You know, the, the, they're the most vulnerable component on an RV and then they're the, the, the least maintained and, and uh, they're neglected the most. And for a while there, uh, all the tire manufacturers were saying, if you're putting it on gravel, that the sharp pieces of the gravel rocks, you know, can can sit and pe penetrate, not really penetrate, but just, you know, just almost blister the inside of it and that you should put a plywood down. And they've changed that. Uh, I mean, they kind of go back and forth all the time, but there was never any proof that that caused a tire failure. You know, the tire failure issue is because of weight and heat and improper pressure. And, you know, you don't know what causes a sudden loss of air in there. It could be something six months, 10 months. <coughs> Excuse me, I got a <clears throat> scratchy throat here. But, um, you know, what they do say, though, is if you're going into a gravel lot that, that have been trying to hit my water here, um, it is a good idea to put um, a untreated wood underneath just so no chemicals from whatever's under that gravel can leach into your tires. Again, yeah. is that overkill? You know, I mean, my folks, uh, we park out in the gravel all the time. Uh, you know, that's, that's where it sits in between trips and they've sold it now, but I mean, for 15 years and even the unit I have now is, is sitting out in the gravel, you know those uh, say tractor supply that have like those cattle rubber pads that you can buy? You can go get a cheap rubber pad <laughs> and make whatever size and length strip you want and just roll up yep. on it, whether yep. it's dualies or singles or whatever. I do, I, I do, I will say though, whatever you decide to put underneath there, make sure it's wider than the tire. Yeah. You know, I see a lot of people that'll block tires up or put some on them. And, right, and right, they, right. Get, they get a two by six and part of the tire is hanging over the side. Now that is bad for a tire. Yeah. yeah. So. You know, you need to have it completely supporting the entire length of that tire. So, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's not a bad idea. Um, I guess if, if, you know, but so Barbara again says last week, you spoke about inspecting foam in cushions found out the unit I like has one layer of foam and one layer of Dacron. And that's good. So Dacron is, you know, and, and the reason they do that is that if you have a really good density foam that's going to hold up for a long period of time in that unit, it doesn't feel comfortable when it's new. You know, you sit on that thing and it feels like you're in Fred Flintstone's house and you're like, this does not feel good. So if you do a softer foam, like a lot of the cheaper manufacturers did for a long time, then it feels really good when it's brand new, you're at the show, you're at whatever. And then six months down the road, you're sitting on that plywood platform because it, it breaks down. And so what we did at Winnebago is we used dual density foam. In fact, we actually used the three layers. One was a very stiff, hard layer, high density foam that was on the bottom. And the second one was a lighter foam. And then we went with the Dacron on top of it. And the Dacron is kind of a, uh, it's almost like a scotch bright type thing. It, it's not quite that rough, but it's these fibers that are just, all, you open it up and it's white and it, it looks, you know, like a really gnarly cat. It looks like Zach's beard. No. <laughs> Zach's so young, he doesn't know who the Flintstones probably are. <laughs> not okay. Sorry, Zach. So any, any, or Tom Petty or David <laughs> Boyd. But the reason they put that Dacron on is it's softer. And then when you slide in and out of that dinette cushion, if you have just regular foam, it rubs back and forth when you slide in and out, especially in the driver's seat or in dinette seats. And eventually it starts to tear 
and it will roll and it creates these little bumps and you know you're sitting on it that it's like ah and it gets worse and worse and worse so barbara that is a good thing in there that they have done a dual density foam um that way when the lighter density breaks down you still have a little heavier one and still have a good cushion you know so that's that's kind of furniture 101. okay arlene's a class of 43. wow okay you then you do know the flintstones so Doug said, what causes my leveling jacks to slowly come up? I have a 2005 Monaco with the Turnabond on the roof, I remember. Diesel <laughs> pusher and uh, RVA2 leveling system. We have a re-level about once a week. RVA2, what do you, are you familiar with that? Monaco's got to be a hydraulic system. Yeah, it, it, it's going to be a hydraulic system. Um, He's either Bigfoot or, or uh, Power Gear, I would imagine. I don't. Yeah. I don't think Monaco used HWH. Didn't they? Didn't they do like a, that Aladdin style system that oh, used the RVA or something yeah. like that? Maybe that's what this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is going to be one of those things that I mean I don't know what does it, but a lot of hydraulic units. It doesn't matter what kind they are. They all kind of do that. They eventually will kind of creep down, let themselves go. Whether it's the jack itself is internally kind of starting to seat past or whatever i mean fluid is going to take the path of least resistance um yeah. what's your opinion what do you think well there could there's three different things that that i've seen you know so when the jacks re are extended the fluid goes through and it's going to push down and it's going to leave it's supposed to leave two psi per square inch in the line system that's kind of their their thing doug says yes it's hydraulic and so, first of all, you have a, uh, a valve that's supposed to keep that fluid, you know, and then the valve will open up to let the fluid go back the other way when it's retracting, whether you get springs or if it recirculates, it comes back through the inside of the jack and, and pushes it up. So you could have a valve that has seals that are getting oh, yeah, weak and just allow enough to seep because there's always pressure on that, on that thing, you know, so it's trying, to, but it's like, oh, I can't quite hold it. The other thing it could be is air in the lines. And, you know, that happens when you have temperature changes, it gets really hot, you're running that system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I guess the thing that I would do is there is a procedure to bleed the air out of that system. And normally it's just running whatever you have. Wow. It's a two, 2005, I'm assuming that you have hydraulic slide rooms with that as well. So run the jacks three or four times. <coughs> uh, Take a look at your owner's manual for your system because in there should be a procedure to do that. And they just, they will get air in there. And, you know, I've talked to some people um, like Power Gear. He said, if it's 2005, I would change the fluid and go to synthetic. And, you know, it could be that your fluid, it's, it's definitely, what, 20, 18 years old? Yeah. Probably. Um, and I would not be changed in that because most people don't even think of doing that. Just, and oh, here comes my my cue. We say like at the Oscars. I have brought my Oscar. I'd like to thank all the people that helped me get this <laughs> the Kelly Award. But uh, you might want to change the fluid in that thing. So we uh, we've got a. Do we have time for one more? Protect all. Find a ProFlex gets hard. We said that one. I am the awning one. Yeah. For power awning, is there any maintenance needed for the motor? So mm. the motors, the motor themselves, like the actual unit, is a sealed unit. There's yeah. nothing. You're not doing anything to the motor. No, they're um, in the canister. Yeah, it, there's nothing like at, at the motor itself. The awning in general, hundred percent. Yeah, you got to. There's maintenance you got to do to the fabric material there's maintenance you do to the arms keeping things clean yeah. um yeah most people don't understand that you know you've got acrylic or uh vinyl material that are in these awnings and they need to be washed um a couple times a year depending on how much grit because you know dirt and mold don't or mold doesn't uh, um, attach to the awning material attached to the dust and the dirt that that's in there and and the awnings are not waterproof themselves the fabric in it and so, um, you know, they recommend you wash it. Now, I know A&E had, if it's acrylic, you use acrylite as their conditioner. 
that that does it. And I think some are now using alpha. But have you heard from uh, Carefree or whoever on what conditioners? The only thing that I've seen that you know I'm going off track, but the uh, a lot of the power lines we keep seeing the LED light strips coming loose or deforming. The wires aren't aren't protected with any kind of corrugated tubing. So keep an eye on all the power wires and all the LED wires on the sides. Yep. Your and, and yep. be on the right hand. The other thing they recommend is any pivot points that you have on the arms, on all the exterior stuff that is exposed, that stuff needs to be, make sure it's not bent, make sure it is lubricated with a good self-drying lubrication like CRC, um, you know, that they recommend it and just that it's all moving properly because those motors aren't real powerful. And, you know, anytime you get any kind of resistance on anything that's in there, the steps, the awnings, the slide rooms, all that kind of stuff, those motors just can't take that resistance and the amp draw is going to go up and eventually you're going to need a new one. So with that, I think we're uh, we're running one minute past, but I appreciate everybody coming out. Claude, Arlene, Doug, Greg, Barbara, um, everybody, we really appreciate you coming out. This is so much easier to do when we don't have to make up questions. We just make up the answers, but we, no, we make up, pick up the questions. So we appreciate you coming out. We'll be here next week. Make sure you go to uh, rvtravel.com, send in any questions you have and uh, the articles that are in there, and we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. Enjoy it. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Zach. Yeah, no problem. Ashley behind the scenes and Chuck.